Okay, so tonight we learn about the uh, blasphemy. Uh, number two, in our current cycle, blasphemy is the last commandment of Noah, of Adam, number six. And, um, and, and it's, uh, it's covered the last portion of uh, <coughs> the book of Genesis. And uh, I would name the, the class today uh, Tamar, uh, Joseph, you, Judah, and Tamar, Joseph, and uh, his master wife. Uh, that's promising your attention, I'm sure, because it's going to be very sexual, but. Uh, it's very juicy story stories, but in fact, uh, the Torah uh, actually kind of, if you want, uh, the Torah capture your atten our attention and introduces here ideas about blasphemy that otherwise you would never know. In fact, that's the way the Book of Genesis is built. It takes us, Moses take, takes us from one commandment to the other, one by one, according to a specific list. And each time it each time he focuses on one commandment, he gives us a lot of information about it <clears throat> that otherwise we simply wouldn't know. We saw it many times in the other commandment, and now we engaged with the last one, blasphemy number six. And it start it starts with the selling of Joseph, which is an act of blasphemy, uh, the secretion of God's name, and uh, recovery from that blasphemy. So what does Moses tell us about blasphemy uh, from that section? Remember, uh, this is number six of uh, Adam, of Noah. So this is part of the curriculum, so to speak, of Noah. Noah should learn the, 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 the section in detail and uh, dissect it and know it by heart because this is a DNA of Noah, the movement, anything to do with the seven commandment. And here is number six, which finishes the uh, book of Genesis. Number seven, of course, is only an addition of Noah uh, when he added after the flood, but uh, another commandment not to eat blood and uh, not to eat an, a, a, a limb from a living animal. But the basic problem, the basic premise of this of the story is Adam six in Eden. So in short, what does Moses wish to tell us about blasphemy uh, from that section? Let's uh, write it down like one by one. I would say number one would be uh, the very idea of uh, blasphemy uh, that uh, that uh, uh, is is blasphemy done by by uh, people who are known to be God abider, God God lovers, abiding by the Torah like Jacob, and if they do such a terrible sin like se se selling them. Uh, the own brother to slavery. If such a royal family, uh, the great the great down in the eyes of other people, seeing them, that is that is the secretion of God's name. So number one, uh, uh, one one. Uh, idea that we can derive from the section is the very idea of 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 of, of what is what constitute 
blasphemical situation and desecration of God's name. And of course, the other the other side is a, is what causes a sanctification of God's name, the opposite. How can you sanctify God's name by doing the opposite? By making other people feel awesome about God. In fact, the Rambam actually pick up Exactly that point here, and when, and he, when he described the law, uh, what what constitute blasphemy in the succession of God, that's exactly what he said. So, in short, you can you can co you can cause blasphemy, you can perform blasphemy, the the secretion of God's name, by one cursing him, God, God forbid. Girls, I mean, either private or public, by your mouth. Number two, by misbehavior. If you are known to be a bider, a God, God lover, and abiding by the law, that you everybody attribute your behavior to the Torah that you learn. So if you misbehave, uh, it causes other people to to desecrate or to denigrate or to look down on the Torah and, on, and you desecrate God's name by your behavior. So either by mouth or by misbehavior. Exactly the opposite is sanctification. I can sanctify God's name in public by standing in public and saying holy, 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 like the angel in heaven. That's what we do in Amida prayer. So you do it by mouth, or you do it by good behavior. If if uh, uh, if a person known to be a uh, God lover, a fear, fear of God, and he does exceptionally good things, he he sanctifies God's name in the eyes of the public, other people. So sanctification and desecration. Is basically the eyes of others. Of course, you can you can go to extreme and sanctify God's name by your life, either by giving up a lot of opportunities, or by simply putting your life on 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 the line. Like in Rabbi Akiva was was crucified and uh, tortured and so on. And he said, wow, uh, uh, when he cried, he didn't cry. So when he was tortured by, by the Roman uh, soldiers. So the student asked him, Rabbi, why? And he was smiling. So why do you smile? He said, all my life I was waiting for opportunity to sanctify God's name, to love Hashem, to sanctify my name, his name by my life. And here I am. So so sanctification is done by either by mouth uh, in prayer in a right in a in a right way, thinking holy, holy, holy along the angelic choir in heaven that poses and waited for mankind to sing, to discuss it, that the idea of uh, came out from the Jacob struggling with the angel there. So either sanctify Hashem by, by your mouth, by singing, or by behavior. Well, so that's uh, point number one that we can learn from, from, uh, from the section that Moses uh, uh, trying to teach us. And uh, the point number two is extremely important that although you committed the heinous uh, sin by saying that there's a question in God's name, there is a remedy. So the, the, the remedy for this equation is sanctification. So the story is built up in such a way. There is one, sto one the story begins with one event, heinous event, selling of Joseph, that's it. A terrible misbehavior that caused uh, change history. 
that's a short story, a short event, and it's over. But then the, the story continues, chapter after chapter after chapter, telling us in a long way how the family recovered. Re tried to recover, attempted to recover, and did it recover by repenting, by asking forgiveness from Hashem and from, from Joseph, and by doing sanctification for God's name. They were ready to, to put, uh, put their life on the line for the brother and for God for God's name. So there are two branches. Uh, there is a downfall and there is a going up. So that number two, uh, so what Moses is saying here, uh, don't be despaired. Suppose you are guilty of such a, uh, a such a misbehavior and you committed blasphemy, there is a remedy. And you can you can uh, uh, restore your, your holiness, you restore your position by 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 doing sanctification. So the family is struggling and they recover. One is Judah, the foremost of them is Judah. The second is your, your Joseph. And then the rest of the family. So Judah is Tamar, as we're going to see in a minute. Uh, her, his uh, name of Hashem appears with Judah three times in the story. And, uh, and with Joseph and his uh, master wife, the name of Hashem appears eight times in just a few, few verses. So those two personalities, brothers, uh, they attempted and they sanctified, they, they restored uh, the, 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 the Shekhinah on them and they, uh, by, by doing sanctification of God's name. So they recovered and the rest of the family followed suit. Number three. So number one, we said, the idea of, of blasphemy, uh, uh, what is it's the question of God's name? How do you how do you how do you do that? Number two, the idea that you can recover. Number three would be, uh, what is the impact of blasphemy on a heavenly court? What, what happens if you perform blasphemy? Well, the answer is again taken from the from the story. For in Elohim eyes, in the in the attribute of, of judgment, that's right. A sin is a sin. You committed a sin, you pay for it. How do you pay for it? Measure for measure. If they sold the brother to slavery to Egypt. What do you think would be their, their retribution? They would be sold. They would go down to Egypt and be enslaved there. So going down to Egypt is, is a punishment, if you want, uh, or retribution for the sin of selling Joseph, measure for measure. So that's in the eyes of Elohim. So Elohim takes over the section, the entire story. His name appear on many, many times. So you can paint the entire story, the entire chapter in red. Because the Shekhinah, YHVL, is gone, departed from them. So Elohim take over and uh, and is an answer to to the scene of blasphemy is by by taking them down to Egypt. But but through the story, uh, the, 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 uh, what Moses is also telling us something even more important. It, it, it depicts exactly how uh, Elohim execute his verdict. 
הרש"י said, אלוקים could have brought them an army and take Jacob down to Egypt with a chain of, of, of iron chain uh, to, to be sold in slavery or to, ex, or to execute the old, old decree that the, he told Abraham that his, his children will be a slave in Egypt. To execute that verdict or that old prophecy, Elohim could have done in, it in many days, but you see it from the story, it's the, how Elohim actually uses them. He doesn't need an army. He just uses the people to, to, to move them in the right direction. We talk about it. He's behind the scene. Uh, but uh, when Joseph is uh, get lost in the field, he, he finds a man, and a man shows, shows him the brothers. And the man, of course, was an angel that uh, Hashem sent to, to direct Joseph to the, in the right direction. So Hashem is executing his verdict, his punishment, uh, or the, uh, also the verdict for the told Abraham years ago. He executed uh, using the, the, the personalities themselves without them being aware of it. It's amazing how each one is moving in his own free will. Nobody is forced to do anything. And yet Hashem's wish is being fulfilled. It's amazing. As a, Hashem has his own free will. He gives us the, our own free will. And somehow, without violating our free will, his feel, his free will is executed, fulfilled. That's called kinship. And kinship of God is an intervention in history behind the scene. Here we're talking about kinship of Elohim. And kinship demands honor. And blasphemy, or the secretion of God's name, is the secretion of the honor of God. You know. So, so the, there's no wonder in this wonderful section that depicts so much in detail the kingship of Hashem. The same section introduces also the idea of blasphemy, the secretion of God's name, the honor of God's name. So what is what Moses is teaching us? What is the meaning of blasphemy? What is the meaning of, of the secretion of God's name? Is doing something that violates his or her honor. Honor of what? Of kingship. What is kingship? Moving history behind the scenes. Oh, we know a God from uh, other uh, capacities uh, before. But here is a new thing. Is a God kingship, interven uh, being uh, intervention in history, moving history in, 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 in the direction he wishes, using us, you use us despite our own will or using our own will to execute his will. So blasphemy is intertwined with the idea of God kingship. Those ideas are, are look to you simple, but they, if in case, they, goes very, they go very deep. And otherwise, without this section, you wouldn't tell. You wouldn't know, what is blasphemy? What do I do if I curse God? I do, I, I diminish his, I violate his honor. If I do it, and that's why it's so important in public. The public, the other people that dictate if you perform the, the, the sin or not. It's, it's not the same if you curse God in the, privately, God forbid, or you stand up on the puppet and curse it in public, like Mussolini. It's two different things.
So kingship. Now, uh, one more thing as we before we leave the topic. Uh, uh, yeah, we talk about kingship of Elohim. What about the kingship of YHVH? We said that the uh, Elohim is uh, uh, is mentioned here many many times. I can paint the entire section with red because he speaks all the time. So where is the YHVH? She disappeared as if offended by the blasphemy. So you see the attributes react differently to the blasphemy. Elohim will punish measure for measure. He is the attribute of justice, of, of, of he is a judge. She, so to speak, she is offended. Uh, uh, you offended her honor, so she shy away. She disappeared from the text. She disappeared not only from the text, she disappeared from the family. And that's the point. Jacob lost his prophetic power. That's why he didn't know where Joseph is. The whole form family fell apart. Brother don't talk to each other. Judah goes down, leave the, leave the family, as we will see in a minute. So the entire family, everything is falling apart. Because the Shekhinah is not on them. So Shekhinah is gone. The party. Her honor and kickship was violated. Uh, let me kind of Pause for a minute, you know, uh, talk about the Shekhinah kingship. Uh, think about it. Uh, you know, we know Shekhinah from a different aspect. I never thought that she, be, she will be a, a rage or, 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 or shy away because of uh, she's bothered about kingship. Uh, let's, uh, let, let's put it in perspective. Uh, she she started uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the beginning, uh, chapter one, uh, she appears uh, to participate in our creation as grace, chesed. The world was created in grace. She, 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 she joined Elohim to in grace. To, show, to build our world in a different shape, which is called grace. Come chapter two with adultery and, uh, and a sin, primordial sin. And after the sin, Hashem appears suddenly different shape and form, a different color. She come and ask Adam, where are you? Before it was driven out, come. Repent, had Adam, Adam repented, he would have stayed in Eden. So she is now appearing as a forgiving attribute. That's called mercy, mercy. It's not so mercy as a forgiving. So already two steps, she, she's going she she entering our universe step by step becoming larger and larger. Then number three, step number three, which is bloodshed. The story and uh, the bloodshed start with uh, Eve seeing Hashem, the Shekhinah, while she's holding the baby. We talk about it many times. And she is seeing the first one is seeing Hashem alone without a looking. And she is thrilled. So for her, uh, Shekhinah is now a loving mother. Loving, merciful, compassion, like, like a mother have compassion to the baby. Seeing only bright future for the children. Love. All that what you what you see in the, in the mothers that they give birth to the child, firstborn child, 
especially. That's a new aspect of, of Hashem. It's different than, than the forgiving. There's no sin here. There's no forgiving here. It's just a new aspect of Hashem that she see from earth uh, while she gives birth. That's number three. Then in uh, before the flood, we see her in a text sitting by Elohim, judging mankind to bring the flood. So she is participate as a judge. It's, it's again, it's not a, a loving mother anymore. It's a mother that's sitting in, in, in a court. So she is now a judge uh, participating in a court. It's a different aspect of, of her, closer and closer to us. That's in bloodshed, moving to number four for Abraham and theft. You know, Abraham saw her as owner, my landlord. He owns the world. She, won she owns the world because she created it. And I'm, she is my landlord, Adon. That's what in English it's called, Lord. It's landlord. Uh, and 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 it's my, it's the order of a castle in which I live. There's a different aspect of of, of a Shekhina. nothing to do anymore with the forgiving, with the loving mother, with the, with the hating she, cruelty. Uh, this is now this is now the owner of the she's owned the world. It, it implicate a lot of implication for that. And I am her slave. She owns me, and she owns everything. That's why I bless her. I bless her for anything I enjoy. I enjoy. A lot of implication for that view. But she's she's coming more and more clear to us in a in a in a in a, in a higher form in a high, in more more clear outlines. We understand her more and more. And then comes the story of Jacob uh, with his uh, uh, with his uh, aspect of Pashachina now. Uh, he struggled with the angels and, and, and that's, she controlled the heavenly court there. And that's called glory. We discuss it. You, go, you can go back to our classes and, and see the struggle of this Esau angel and you will see the, the glory. So there's the concept of glory. So now, now Hashem is not only grace or, or forgiving or loving mother, or, but she is uh, she is what she is she has, she's glory, and the angels sing for her glory. Tiferet in Hebrew. So Tiferet is in between. And the diagram there, they put the ferret in between a, a grace and 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 a lokin. The ferret is in the middle there. Ferret, and that's also called rachamim. So we 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 he learn more and more about the the different aspect of uh, attribute how how Hashem appears to the world. And now, after Jacob, after Tiferet, we are at the kingship level. She is not only, she is now appearing, uh, not only, uh, she is continuing to penetrate our world, and she controls history. She is not a form. It's a different attribute, it's a different shape of uh, light of Hashem. She is not only uh, those uh, uh, mothering, love, uh, loving mother uh, who, who, like, who love us, uh, who, who forgive us. Uh, she, is, she is a king. And a king demands uh, honor. And she is so sensitive. So if you commit blasphemy, to denigrate their honor in the eyes of the public, Elohim will punish you. 
God forbid. But uh, she, she is different. She simply, she is here on contingency. She didn't want to be here to the first place. So she, she disappeared from the text. Wow. If she disappears, leaving us in the eyes of Elohim, you know the result. That's how we started. That's, that's, that's a point that's a square number one. Uh, chapter one in Genesis. Had he not invited her, he would have uh, long ago uh, uh, terminated our universe, what she says, many years ago. So we are still alive here only because she agreed to, to enter. Now, if you offend her, glory, kingship, and you deny her intervention, and you offend her kingship, so to speak, uh, then, then uh, what? Uh, then uh, you are, she, if she's got forbid she's, she's living her, she, here she didn't live. Bless her, it didn't cause her to live, but she disappeared from the text. She is shy anyhow. Uh, if you remember the story of Genesis chapter one, uh, she entered the universe as an attribute. Uh, nobody see her in the text chapter one. You need to learn, you need to see the Y age, the age at the end of the story, at the end of this uh, connecting sixth day to the Sabbath. She is like a bride coming to the world with a veil. You don't see her. She's shy to start it. And now, if she, as shy as she is, as modest as she is, causing blasphemy will cause her to disappear more. And there is nothing more important than her being here. You know what? The, the, we, mankind are born for one purpose, to allow her to enter our heart. Show me any religion that says that God, the almighty God, the most powerful aspect of God, all he wants is to enter your heart. Is there any other religion that would say that? We are, she's begging us to, 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 uh, to accept her and to allow her to enter our heart to change it, to become very good, so we can enter the Sabbath. So the almighty God that uh, can do everything, she's here asking, her, asking to enter our heart. Because we are made, we, the only reason that we are here is to uh, offer her a room in our heart so we can change according to her dimension, her, her, her criteria. So that is Judaism. I have all kinds of definitions from Judaism. God, God created the universe to shower goodness on us. God created the universe for this and this and this. You know what God created the universe? He was seeking for human being to dwell in his heart. Do you know why the black holes exist? Why the nova exists there? Black matter, all this out there? Billion of years of history of evolution for one purpose, Moses said that God is seeking a heart to dwell in. And if you commit blasphemy and you cause her to shy away, so what the hell are you doing here, man? 
There is no purpose of your living here. Okay. So, now going back to the text, and we said we're going to learn about uh, Judah and, and Joseph. They are the, the one in the family. They are the first one to recover. Uh, can I show a slide here? Yeah, okay. Change my virtual background. I believe Tamar and Judah, this is it. So the first story is about Tamar and Judah. So the, the family is trying to go up to recover, which is the main message of the story, that you will recover for blessing by sanctification of God's name. So the, you know the story. The story is Uh, that uh, uh, jo you, Judah, we don't have time to go every detail, but in in a, not in a large, from a bird point of view, Judah going down. He leave his family, and he said, "Go down, go down." You can say, "Go down to the south," but go down spiritually. So you would think, you would have thought that Judas continue to fall apart. He already participated enough in selling Joseph. He is the one who told the, the brother to put him, uh, to sell him. But this, he maybe saved his life, but he also guilty of that. And you would have thought that he continued to deteriorate, but no. You see the the behind me the child that tell us a story and you see how many time how many time uh, uh, YHVH is mentioned um, uh, it, everything is read because Elohim takes over and YHVH appears three times. Judah, he says that Judah uh, came down and he, had, he married a, a, a Canaanite woman. People see it as a derogatory term, a sign of his failure, but not necessarily. Uh, they probably, maybe other brother also uh, married local girls. And, uh, and uh, the first son, Er, was, was, uh, was evil. And a shame, YHVH uh, killed him. Doesn't specify why. But the fact is that suddenly you see a blue, blue, a shame in a sea of red. And then uh, the second one was also guilty of not, not, uh, not allow uh, uh, Tamar, uh, the, the wife of the deceased brother, he didn't want to impregnate her. To confirm the lever, lever, leverite uh, law, so uh, Hashem also killed him. So the name of Hashem appeared three, two, three times there, indicating the dog thinks that Judah departed just because he was falling down. He was coming up. He he was able to restore the name of Hashem above him. And the rest of the story shows it, that he he become a widower and he and he does not his, his job was supposed he was supposed to give a Tamar, the, the wife of the two brothers, to the third one, but he declined. And he himself should have taken could have taken her to a wife. She also declined, thinking that she was somehow guilty of their demise. He blamed her. And she was sitting there for many, many years, several years, waiting and waiting, nothing happened. So she took, she took 
the step by herself. Now, people laugh at this. People don't understand what she was doing. The law says, and listen to that, a woman should be modest. Should, a woman should chase the man. Beside one occasion, when she is a leverite, when she is, she is bound to a brother, or the deceased brother, to, to a remaining brother. There, like Ruth. Ruth went, Naomi told Ruth, dress up, go to the, to the, uh, to the silo where, where, where he was sleeping, you know, Boaz was sleeping. And people laugh, say, oh, Ruth was immodest. No. She was obligated to do that because the Torah says they, she should come up and she, she should search, look to fulfill the obligation. It's one exception in a million that a woman is asked by the Torah to go after the male. And here, here Tamar did it. Well, she disguised herself as a whore. And you know the story. He was a widower, and he fell in charge. He fell. He committed sin. No problem. No problem. No, there's no. He thought that he was committing sin. There's no issue about it. In fact, he committed a, a mitzvah. She certainly committed the mitzvah, although she was disguised as a, as a sinner. It's a, this beautiful discussion in the Gemara. Anyhow. When she's, she asks him, uh, she, she, he leaves with her the stuff uh, and, um, and some uh, sign that, they, uh, that uh, to identify the, him, uh, to defy the person who impregnated her. And finally, when she was impregnated and he decided to, uh, to he, he decided that she should burn because she violated the law. And she 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 is uh, in her honesty. She says she sent him the stuff and the apple and what whatever there. And she asked uh, the men, you know the the men who who own those things. Uh, he impregnated me. Look how modest she she was, and she was ready to put her life. He could have denied it, and she would have been burned. And she didn't want to smear Jacob's son in public. Kind of sanctified God's name. And he re responded on his own. Said, wow, when he saw that, she is righteous than me. In public. Admitting what he did. Also act of sanctifying God's name in public, and she, he said she was righteous, you could read it, she was righteous, period, for me, I am the father, or she is righteous than me, anyhow, doing in the public, qualified him as the one who sanctified God's name in public, and that's why the Shekhinah dwell on him, how many times? Three. Let's go to to uh, to uh, the story of uh, of Je of Mo of, Je of Joseph now, and see how he sanctified God's name. Okay, Joseph's story will follow suit. Are you know the story? I don't have to repeat it. He was sold to his master, uh, Egyptian officer, or pharaoh, high officer. And the Torah says that uh, he was so successful that his master saw that he's so successful that he placed him in charge. And the rabbi asked, how, how could the master know that uh, Hashem helped him? He said, the master saw that Hashem helped him helping him, that's why he put him in charge. How did he know Hashem? 
from, from Joseph. Everywhere he went, his name of Hashem was his mouth. He used to say like, oh, with God's help, I'll do this. With God's help, I'll do this. So they heard from him all day long the name of Hashem. In other words, he did not conceal the fact that he is a, a Jacob's son, believing in one God and, and believing in Hashem. And he, he mentioned it time and again, sanctifying God's name in the eyes of uh, the family, at least. And then uh, he was so successful, beautiful, and the wife of his master tried to seduce him several times. He denied it. Finally, when they were alone, uh, she he, she struggled with him. He ran out. She grabbed a piece of his, his uh, robe, she, and it was cut. And then the master came home. She said, oh, you see, that man uh, that you leave, you left here, this slave, the, the Hebrew slave tried to attack me. And, 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 and of course, he put him in jail. He deposed him from his position, putting him in feral jail, which nobody comes out from there. Not very soon. Dungeon. And so Joseph knew all that ahead of time. He knew that if he, if he resisted her, he could, he could sense that something bad will happen to him. And yet he, he, he put his life on the on the line because he knew that everybody knew uh, knew him that the God fear, and if he now misbehave with his master wife, it put a bad name on Hashem. So he sanctified God's name by his behavior. Now, how many time in the sea of red? Remember, the entire section of the Torah there is read, Elohim. Look how many times Hashem appeared here in just few verses. It's Joseph. You see that? Eight times. Eight times Hashem's name appears. It's just three or four verses. It is the most dense a fashion in the Torah. You can never find any other section of the Torah that the Shem appear eight times, one after the other, in just a few verses. Joseph sanctified a Shem name. Compared to Judah, much more. Judah had done it only three, with three times. He did it eight times. Now, why eight? You can say eight. It's a good good number to represent Joseph because what? Seven commandments of Noah plus circumcision. We already said that uh, Joseph believed at that point that all the Noahide nations, all the nations of the world should circumcise themselves entering Abraham covenant. That's why when he came to power, Rashi says, he ordered them to circumcise themselves. Eight times. So it's a meaningful, very meaningful number for Joseph. Sanctifying God's name. So we have now two characters from the family rising up from the depression of blasphemy. In what way? By sanctifying God's name. Since they are up front, they are going to be the leader of the pack. Not only in this story, but in history. We're talking about uh, not only kingdom of uh, Joseph and kingdom of Judah, but uh, the futuristic Messiah. They are leading, they are leader of the pack. And the brothers of the brother follow suit. Uh, they, the rest of the story, as we might learn next week, God willing, uh, they, they, they uses their, uh, they, they uses the route. How do you, how do you, how do you sanctify your life? God name by repentance. 
by asking forgiveness, by putting your own life on the line, and by chanting, in chanting, so to speak, in a group of 10, holy, holy, holy. Uh, that's kind of a little higher level. But uh, in summary, all that I was saying here is, is part of Noahide curriculum. It's it's no it's a part of of a thing that relate to seven six Adam six commandment of Adam that end up in in the end of this, of Genesis. So blasphemy and sanctification of God's name is part of of Noahide uh, obligations, and you learn from this. If you are, I I only touch the surface. You can dissect it more and more and learn many things about the issue just from the text. The only difference between Noahide and Israel is that Israel is obligated to do this, to do sanctification. Noahide are rewarded by this. They are expected and rewarded, but they are not, not obligated. Uh, Israel, uh, an Israelite cannot escape when a chance for him to, when he has to, God forbid, to, to sanctify God's name either by life or by avoiding misbehavior. He should, by law, do it. No hide are more uh, more lenient in that set, in effect. They are not obligated, but certainly they are rewarded. There are many many stories in the, in the Talmud that saying how uh, telling how uh, even Roman centurion, Roman legionary, the one who destroyed Jerusalem, uh, some of them uh, committed. Uh, sanctification of God's name, and they, uh, God, uh, the heavenly voice came out saying, "Oh, this centurion merit to sit by my throne." So it's uh, uh, the topic is certainly certainly relevant to to Noahide. So in short, we learn we try to derive few concepts from from the story, but Moses is trying to tell us. What he's telling us, not trying, but telling us about blasphemy and sanctification. We, we learn what it what it means. It, we learn that it it it, uh, it is tied up to the concept of kingship, which is very strongly here. The Shekhinah appear here as a king. To our surprise. And um uh, and uh, and uh, the, the concept of a kinship and the concept of uh, uh, restoration of your status. It's not the end of the story. If you, uh, it is always a remedy if it's done honestly from, from sincere heart. Any question for me? Well, a lot of things, a lot of things to think about, and uh, we need to digest it and to put it in our curriculum. It must be on the tongue of every Noahide. It should be versed in there, and like 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 any Israelite, it's not only Noahide. Have a good week and see you next time. Thank you for being with me. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Bye. Thank you.